I'm standing on a salt marsh in North Wales. Behind me you can see a sand dune and beyond that there's mud flat in the Irish Sea. And over here you've got a sea wall protecting houses, businesses and local industry. So the sand dune protects a salt marsh. The salt marsh dissipates wave energy to protect the sea wall which in turn protects the lives of the people beyond. This mosaic of habitats and the interactions between them provide many more positive benefits for the natural environment and the people who live and work here than if the marsh existed on its own. Salt marshes are rich and active environments. Bees pollinate, birds nest, cattle, sheep, brown hare and small mammals graze and feed. When the tide's in, fish swim and crabs hunt in the creeks that wind their way through the marsh, depositing deep layers of carbon-rich mud. When the tide turns, nutrients flow through the creeks, feeding the mud flats and estuary and the seas beyond. But it's not just their physical value that makes salt marshes so important. Like all coastal margin habitats, they're also embedded in our public psyche. Who can forget the frightening figure of Magwitch in Great Expectations, hiding on the lawless marshes of North Kent? Or the iconic paintings of Sir Peter Scott showing wild geese floating onto the marshes of the Solway? My focus has been on managing and restoring salt marshes, taking down sea defences and recreating salt marsh on former agricultural land. The really exciting prospect of rewilding for me is the potential to restore and recreate not just a salt marsh or a seagrass bed or a sand dune or oyster reef, but fully integrated and interacting ecosystems where the sum benefits will be greater than the parts. This is eminently possible. We need to bring experts together, from practitioners to policy makers, from artists to economists, and just see how far we can get with this approach.